Welcome to the inaugural episode of Sonics Forever Live. My name is Brad Burns. This is a show by the fans, for the fans. You cut me open, you cut everybody that's in the audience open. We bleed green and gold. And we are honored to have two of the best to ever wear the green and gold with us today. Dale Ellis and Xavier McDaniel. Welcome to Sonics Forever Live. How's it feel to be back in Seattle? Oh, it's great. The weather reminds me of a lot of good days, <laughs> a lot of rainy days. A lot of great right days. Now. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as I got off that plane with them shorts on, I was like, oh, <laughs> you forgot where you were going. Yeah. What's, what's the reception like when, when you guys are, are walking around town? Do, do people recognize you? Talk about stories when you're in Sonics? I know for me, normally in the airport, they see me, but with the mask on, yeah, I had a lot of people just looking, but they wasn't sure. Right. So, but normally without that mask, you know, a lot of people, oh, Xavier, nice to see you. But uh, this particular time, I was able to come on in with my mask looking like Batman. Yeah. So, uh, incognito. Yes. yes. Incognito, definitely. Mm-hmm. I know you, you said uh, at one point that the X-Man was almost like a, a superhero, a, a character. So yeah. that's true to life at this point when you got the mask on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it almost make me feel well. Old, old superhero now. Uh, Superheroes never die. Ain't moving as fast as I used to. <laughs> you know, everybody talking. About, you know, earlier we were doing the autograph signing. We we're talking about the pictures and how cool they are. And I made a comment. Oh, where the body went. <laughs> so you know, but that's that's what happens when you get older, though. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I I'm taking that back for for what I did those twelve years. Well, we have a ton to cover. Um, and hopefully we can fit it all in, in this time frame. Let's start in 1987, the 87 team. Surprised everybody. This is the last team to finish below 500 to win a playoff series. Not only did you win one playoff series, you won two playoff series. Right. Finished the season 39 and 43. Played Dallas in the first round. Dallas was the two seed. Sonics was the seven seed. Right. Dallas had their best record up to that point in team history. Um, most wins in team history, and they had beaten Sonics five times that year, five and zero against the Sonics. They just drill you in the first game, and it's like, okay, it's every game, yeah, <laughs> great, great to have you guys yeah. here. Uh, this is cute. We'll see you later. It seemed like that's all it would be, and then you guys run off three straight wins, beat Dallas, your old team. Mm-hmm. At what point did you guys start to believe in yourselves and, and determine that, hey, you know, we, we can not only compete with these guys, we can beat these guys? Right. Well, the, the expectations were low. You know, um, before the season started, we were picked to finish last, right, right out of back. Picked us to, to finish last, and uh, we just squeaked into the playoffs. So there was no real expectation. We were just gelling as a team. They did run through us five consecutive times during the regular season and got us in the first first game of the playoffs. But we took a look at some film and it was just about getting the ball cross court uh, and to get into our offense. We were rushing to get, get into our offense. So we were able to handle that by X setting a hard pick on Derek Harper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we remedied that situation. Nate was able to get the ball down the court. We get into our offense on time. And it's just a matter of winning one game. You can take off from there. You build your confidence. And that, that Dallas team was, was loaded, too. People forget how, how good that team was. Yeah. What was it like for you to be on the other, you know, these were guys, you, you were in Dallas for three years? Three years. Uh, guys that you came up with, Derek Harper, Sam Perkins, yeah. uh, one, one of our, our Sonic favorites. Dallas was on the yeah. team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roy Tarpley, yeah. a really loaded yeah. team. Choir. Yeah. Uh, Mark, for Mark, Mark, yeah. Yep, exactly. Uh, for you, how did that feel to, to be on, you know, these guys are doing great, I'm here. How, how were you able to, to step your game you up? Know, a, lot of, a lot of fans think I started in Seattle. My career started here, but uh, it was the first three years it was in Seattle, I mean, uh, in Dallas. Uh, I played, but I didn't get the time that I wanted on the floor. Requested a trade, ended up in Seattle, and it couldn't, couldn't have been a better situation for me. Uh, Bernie did an excellent job of recognizing talent and putting the ball where it needed to be. Gave him the green light to go ahead and shoot the ball. But in the playoffs, you know, playing against those guys, it was uh, just like practice. But the three years I was there, practice time was play time for me. So I worked hard in practice every day, waiting for that opportunity to play. And so it, it was exciting to play against Dallas. Um, 
they were playing great basketball. I believe they had won more games that year than anybody in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And I uh, picked to get, get to the Western Conference Finals easily. But, uh, yeah, we put it on them. Yeah, the fun. plants. Are... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so after Dallas, you move on to Houston, who they were the defending Western Conference champions. They, they lost to one of the best teams in NBA history, the 86 Celtics, in the finals, going up against Young and Keem and Ralph Sampson, who still had, had a little bit left in the tank at that point. And again, heavy underdogs, and you guys came in and did what you had to do. Once you get past Houston, you move on to the Lakers. Uh, Lakers sweep you, but in, in that Houston series specifically, I went back and watched game six, thanks to the uh, power of YouTube, w watched the entire game. Um, it seems like people, forget how good the two of you were. They think of you, Dale, as a three-point specialist, and in X, you're the enforcer. And that's not really accurate, because you guys you had really great all-around games. Uh, you were crashing the offensive boards, I mean, from mid-range, outside, I mean, there wasn't anything you couldn't do offensively. And we were talking about this earlier. Your game offensively was so well-rounded to be able to to crash the boards and bring the energy that you did, it, uh, it, it's almost a disservice to, to think of, you know, Dale's a three-point shooter and X is gonna right. choke out West Matthews. <laughs> 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 what, what was it like going up against Houston in, the, in that game six? It was a double overtime game, it's an awesome game. If anybody has, I think it's two hours, almost three hours without commercials, it's a longer game, uh, but well worth watching because it's, it's a great watch. I, I personally think that people don't know how good Tom Chambers was. And <clears throat> the NBA is all about matchups. That matchup, believe it or not, favored us. See, people say Kareem, Ralph Sampson, but nobody's looking at Tom Chambers and nobody's looking at Dale Ellis. Mm -hmm. They were the bigger scorers in that series for us. Uh, and even in the regular season. You know, Tom Chain was all on Ralph Sampson. I could, he, I was like, when I throw it, you got to go get it because I don't want to be here and burn him out. <laughs> Tom would just catch it and he would dunk it backwards. I mean, Dale coming off screens, guys on him. You got Lewis Lloyd, uh, or Robert Reed, I mean, because mm -hmm. uh, Lewis Lloyd and Mitchell Wiggins got suspended. You had uh, Rodney McCray guarding between me and Dale. Um, but Dale and, and, and Tom had their numbers. You go back and you look at all, I think we played them five times that year. Dale and Tom had some incredible numbers against them. I felt like the numbers came to us and we've always played them well. So when we got down there, we won game one. So we said, hell, why not win game two? <laughs> and we wind up winning game two and on the strength of Dale and Tom. And, um, you know, we came here, I think we lost game three. Mm -hmm. And then we played game four and one and lost game five and came with an epic game six with double overtime. Uh, Akeem Olajuwon had a monster game. Mm -hmm. no, no answer for Akeem. You talk about the, the yeah. mismatch for, yeah. for Chambers, which is absolutely I'm you, talking correct. about 50, something like 52 points. I think points. he has 49, 49 and 23. Yeah. At that point, Akeem, who I... Push comes to certain shove. I think he might be one of the yeah. ten best of all time. Just yeah, such a talent, and, and nobody been playing basketball for like five years at that point. And, 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 and then a Sonic fan, we're about to call a timeout. Nate and Tom Chambers rushing up court, and he had this incredible dunk against uh, Robert Reed for a three point, and I think that kind of helped us out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a great, great series. It was a tiring. I've probably never been that tired in a game. <laughs> We're double overtime. Well, obviously, I'm going home and go to sleep. That was a, that was, a, I mean, that was a physical game, and I, I know I got some bumps and bruises right now going on from that game. That was, that was a hell of a game. How much did that game six and everything that you put into that affect the Western Conference Finals against the Lakers? I think it affected a lot. You know, I, I, I thought we had a great chance to beat the Lakers, and I think that's what we talked about in these games. Mm -hmm. Game one, keeping the game close. Don't let Magic 
do all the Houdini passes, don't have James Worthy doing all the dunking, and get the liquor crowd into it. And I think for the first two games, we kind of mm -hmm. did that. But mm -hmm. when you have a Magic Johnson who can put his head down and then beep, beep, they're shooting free throws while we're trying to make jump shots or pulse moves. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big key into that. Uh, first three games, I won't say, I don't think it was no more than 12 or 14 points that separated us. Mm -hmm. It might have been less than that. And then we kind of got a, got a butts whipped in game four because I think everybody kind of hard to come back from a 3-0 deficit. Gets, mm -hmm. I mean, you, they got hell. They got what? Kareem Abdul, I mean, um, Hall of Famer. Worthy Kareem Hall of Magic Famer. Or Magic Johnson yeah. Hall of Famer. Easily you know, through the 10 deaths. And right now we're playing, nobody's in the Hall of Fame, myself, Dale, or Tom. So, I mean, they were favorites, but, I mean, it was a, it was a good series. Uh, you know, I just wish that uh, a few things we could take back. I mean, TV is a lot better now than it was 30 years ago because if you make a bad call today, they got a camera that's going to pick it up. You know, back then, you know, uh, you didn't have those cameras like you got. I mean, you got cameras everywhere. So, um, but I know in that game, I don't know if they remember, we were, we were doing well. It looked like the game's going down the wire. Alton Lister blocked um, Magic shot, and they called two free throws on it. That was a big, and we come down and miss the shot. They come down and get a free throw shot, and they wind up winning the game by like two or three points. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I think in the day's game, we had a better shot than the old game because, you know, the Lakers were the premier team. Yeah, They were. They went on to win the title that year. Yeah. Going into that offseason, hopes were high because you guys got farther than anybody expected. And you had two high draft picks. You had the number five pick and the number 10 pick. Ended up with Olda Polonis and Derek McKee. Uh, there's an alternate universe where the could have been Scottie Pippen and maybe Horace Grant, but that's uh, that's but, how things break sometimes. But I mean, think about it. You got Dale Ellis and you got me. Yep. You don't know what Scottie's going to do. And I was looking forward to playing with him because it was a lot of talk about him being a you know point forward. Mm -hmm. But we also got Nate McMillan. So, you know, I tell people all the time, where was he going to play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been very tough for him. I think that we needed, we let Alton, not Alton Lester, we let Maurice Lucas go. Mm -hmm. Clement Johnson wasn't really playing um, a lot, and we needed to get bigger up front. So that's why I think we went for Derek McKee, who was a great athlete, and we went for Olin for Bolt at that center position. I think they were two good picks for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, when you're playing with Michael Jordan, how can you not excel? I mean, Scotty put in the work, obviously, with that. But, I mean, uh, you don't know how, to, how something's going to happen. It worked out well for Chicago. And uh, I thought Derrick was a, was a great backup to Tom and myself. Um, and then when they let Tom go, I thought it was one of the worst things you could ever do. That's You never let an all-star go for nothing. That's a great transition. So yeah. Tom, Tom Chambers left the following season via free mm -hmm. agency. He was the first unrestricted free agent in NBA right. history. Uh, ends up in Phoenix. Talk about big three. It's, well, I don't know if we can count Kyrie at this point, but for argument's sake, Kyrie, KD, Harden, you guys were really kind of the first big three, the two of you and Tom Chambers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the second. The, who's the first? First would be Dan Hitzel, Alex English, and Kiki. Ooh, Vanderland. okay. He's South Carolina guy. Yeah. So you're going back to South yeah, Carolina. Yeah. yeah okay. almost, I'm, but I say we're the first to score 23 or more points. Nobody did it. But I, I would say Kiki Van the way in <laughs> and throw him in there. Guy just give me fits. Well, we're talking Kiki Sonics Kiki. here. So you yeah. guys got to be the first. Yeah. But I might have to give you that. Yeah. So you, you guys had one hell of a nucleus. Mm -hmm. All three of you were young. Tom goes to, to Phoenix, and it's almost like one step back. How did it feel for, for each of you once Tom left and there wasn't any compensation on the other end? Well, you feel like you end up stepped your game up. 
in a way, but you know, like what X was mentioning, Derek McKee, if Derek was going to come into his own, come out of Alabama, you know, it's going to take a little time to start burning uh, coaches as players, but Derek was a great, he could have played point four easily for us, held the ball well, could go left or right, could jump, and uh, played good defense. So, yeah, we were just hoping that McKee could fill that, that slot. Yeah, we needed him to fill that slot. Mm -hmm. But, um, like I said, you don't let a Tom Chambers go for free. And that's basically mm -hmm. what we did. But, uh, you know, Derek came in and he did some, some, a lot of good things for us. But it also, I think me and Dale, um, we didn't really, I think we needed to elevate our game a little bit more too. And sometimes we, I, used, I know I used to wait on, you know, guys to get going because I didn't always need plays. I go to the offensive board and I get out on the break and Nate knew if I was out on the break to throw it up, I'll go get it. Mm -hmm. So we just had to, and I know Bernie used to always say, young fella, calm down. Because I used to say some choice words like F the Lakers and F these guys and <laughs> F these guys. I'm tired of sitting back. I want to be, because I mean, high school I won, college I won, came to the NBA, and that was my ultimate goal to come to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And knowing that this team six years prior, I watched them in the finals, didn't know where the hell Seattle was at. I'm saying, Washington, D.C.? <laughs> Seattle, why they could be in the same city? I don't know. I, I've never been this far out west. Well, yeah, well, I did go to Oregon one time, but um, I'm sitting there trying to figure it out. But I was 16 at the time, so I didn't know where Washington was really at. But like I said, I just wanted to get make sure Coach Wilkins, when he brought me in, that I could get this team going and I can get us going and get us in the right way. You know, we traded. Dale for our, I mean, I, I would for Dale mm -hmm. Ellis, and I thought that was one of the big things. Now we got the shooter. You know, Tom was that. Tom is the prototype forward of today. He was 30 years ahead of his time, mm -hmm. shooting threes. He just drive us crazy. We throw the ball to Tom, Tom flipped that mug and shoot it. We're like, ah, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, um, I just, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we had a fantastic team, but we just, we were all young too. You got to realize that we were all young, and and I think sometimes that's why I felt like we should have brought Maurice Lucas back, because Luke will keep you in check. Yeah. And and so we didn't bring him back. Now you're telling me you want me to step up, but I wasn't ready to be that type of leader. You know, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna play, but I ain't I ain't one to be like, God damn it, Taylor, God damn it, Nada. Blase, blase, you know. I just want to go out play basketball. We needed, we we needed that. We needed that veteran presence, somebody who who kick your tail when mm -hmm. you need that respect and you need to be brought back down. We ne we didn't have that guy, you know. And I thought we needed more reason, but we won what forty four games. I think forty seven. Forty four, like forty four yeah. games. So, I mean. We, we, we did raise it a little bit, something mm -hmm. like that. You, you guys were, were definitely in the mix, and, and you, yeah. you both came to Seattle a year apart. X, X you were 85, Dale, you were 86. 86. Yeah. Your best year statistically, without question, were in Seattle. Right. What was it about the team, the atmosphere, the city, Bernie being your coach, that unlocked that potential in each of you? Well, you know, I was always a team player. I was, I was asked to play as a big man. I was drafted as a small forward. Um, I went to Dallas and I was in between with, um, you know, Mark Aguirre and um, Orlando Blackman. So I come to Seattle and uh, Bernie said, I'm going to try him at the two position. I'll let Xavier bring the ball down the floor. So I've always played with my back, back to the basket, never worked on the ball handling skills really, but worked on shooting. But uh, just him opening the door, giving us that opportunity. And again, there was no expectations because we were, we were young. We had to learn how to play together as a team. I remember in Seattle, uh, LA, our first game in LA, Bernie made a uh, coaching decision. He put myself and Xavier in the starting lineup. I was thrilled to death. I don't know, I believe Nate was a little nervous. He had to go against Magic. <laughs> so don't worry about it, just throw me the ball. I got you, I got you. But yeah, it was, uh, it was just fun playing with each other. If we were on the road somewhere, it could be 10 of us at a theater somewhere watching a movie. So we were 
we were a close-knit team, and that's important when it comes to winning basketball games. You're both in town for Lenny Wilkins' dedication, street dedication for him. Lenny drafted you. Yes. Lenny was the general manager at the time right. and, and drafted you. You've known Lenny for 35-plus years. Uh, it's hard to, to even imagine half of the memories from the Sonics franchise without Lenny. What has he meant to, to you guys uh, from a, a career standpoint, even a, even a personal standpoint? Well, Lenny was general manager uh, that brought you in, right? Yeah. Yes, and I believe he, he started the process for me to come in as well. Okay, so and, it's not, not all wits it? Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't believe so. Then, then uh, I think he left in 87, right? Something like that. Well, but anyway, I'd come back to Seattle every year just to, uh, you know, play in his golf tournament, support his foundation. It was a good excuse to come see Seattle again, too. You know, I loved it here. Although I was playing for other teams, I kept my home here for 20 years. So I spent the summers here. I can, it's the most beautiful place to be, Seattle, during the summers. But uh, Lenny has always been a class act. And any opportunity to do some work with him, I jumped at that. And, um, so it was just fun being able to support him. And just like Dale said, I, even though I played for some other places, <clears throat> I kept a home here, too. I had a home here for 27 years. His ex-wife sold, sold my house here. <laughs> so, uh, um, so, I mean, when he brought me in um, and we sat down and talked, he told me what my expectation was. We need to make the Sonics relevant again. And so, uh, and I, I, I used to live right down the street from Mosso when I first got here. I was at 61, I think it was 6101 Apartments. It's, Right off 139th, and he was staying off there, and I was staying in a gated community, and um, and uh, he was. We would just talk all the time about how we want to get the Sonics back going, and uh, we had a little contract issue my first year because I was staying at the Red Lion <laughs> for like three months. I just got married, and I'm just sitting in the hotel, and I'm just working out over at the Pro Club every day. And I'm playing against, you know, Al Wood and Gerald Henderson, a lot of those guys who were here, Brick Mikowski. And I'm getting frustrated because, you know, they told me they're going to get this contract out. They want me in town. I've been here for about three months, and I miss my wife with all that known. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm going back to Kansas, man. And I made one phone call and said, I need to come home, man. They got me a ticket. I went home. Two weeks later, they signed. We signed the contract. I come back, and um, it was all about work since then, you know, um, to make the Sonics relevant. And I, like I said, I I have nothing against OKC, you know, but I, I root for the Sonics. That's who I root for, you know. Uh, people can do what they want, but that's who I root for. It would be very difficult for me to go against the Sonics, because that would be like going against the Sonics for me. I tell people I bleed green. And if the Hall of Fame ever called me, I'm going in as a Sonic. I would tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, one of my first introductions to Seattle also was uh, Gus Williams, right there on Queen Anne. Yeah. Yeah, when the office was there. So, I mean, I, I, I bleed green and, and uh, I know Dale bleed green, so mm -hmm. nothing to with o OKC. I, it just hurts that the team was gone, and 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 hopefully, like I said, three to four years. I think get that arena. I know the team's coming back. Yep, and you, you're absolutely right. Nothing against OKC. Yeah. Uh, you guys probably know this that you're in NBA 2K on the all-time Thunder team. Right. If anybody has any sense, they got to change the jersey because they got to be wearing the green and gold. Uh, What's it like? I, I know you both have young kids. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the, the latest incarnation of the game to see the video game version of yourself and it looks just like you and they play like you. What, what, what's that experience like? I have not watched the 2K game. No? Uh, You're missing out. It's a good time. Now, now you said Techno Bowl. You said Techno Bowl back in the day. I haven't played a video game. My Double son, dribble? My son Xavier, who lives out here now with his mom, he played video games so much that I got I got rid of my 
PlayStation. I, I have not played in about 15 years. Mm -hmm. He plays so much. So I I haven't even watched it unless somebody shows it to me. I have, I have no clue. How, how much do you guys get uh, from, from 2K? <laughs> not well, how, how big are those 2K checks? Not enough, man. Not, not nearly enough. <laughs> I don't even know how they do it, to be honest. <laughs> they just send you a check out twice a year. Yeah. What's, what's not enough? Is that like... Five grand, ten grand. It's a little bit more. Hundred grand. No, I'm nothing to write home about. Okay. Hundred yeah. grand. I may be in Vegas it's again. Lunch money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where I'm thinking. If it's a hundred grand, I just lost some money in Vegas. <laughs> One of the most fun players to play with in 2K is, of course, Sean Kemp. You guys got Sean uh, in the '89 draft, and came out of Trinity Valley Junior College. Not a Ton was known about him. What are your memories when he when he first showed up? I remember him being real quiet. Yeah, he worked hard. He had to go against Xavier every day in practice, so he had to be he had to be mentally tough. You could see he was starting to develop, coming to his own. But it's kind of hard to judge talent like that mm -hmm. at, at that age. I do remember him taking beer out of the locker room because <laughs> he was underage. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. for me. I see the guy who's athletic. Mm -hmm. And one time I said, boy, where your mama at? Why do you see? Because you ain't no 18 years old, 19 years old. That's just how athletic mm -hmm. he was. And um, Sean, was a, he was a good kid. Uh, you know, um, he'll be in practice, man, and he'll be doing some incredible damn dunks. And I'll be like, oh, man. And then I don't know if you remember when he dunked against Golden State. Mm -hmm. I, I still don't know how he did that. <laughs> he went baseline, he came in, and he just kind of hooked Duncan. I was like, God damn, did y'all see that? <laughs> and so you seen the athletic ability and the raw ability that he had, and it just took some time for him. Hmm. And unfortunate situation with me and Dale, that kind of elevated a little quicker. <laughs> You know, so we're, we're going to get to that situation so in, in, in a second. That, did, did you know that Sean credits you for mentoring him that, that first year as I, speaks the world of you? I used to stay on Sean a lot because I know he was sneaky like most kids <laughs> because I was sneaky, too. But uh, I mean, we, we used to talk, I, he used to want to go to the clubs and I used to make I used to like get him in the club. But I would make sure he didn't drink and I would make sure he stayed with me a lot of the times, too. I mean, I think about you, you're 19 years old, you're at home all the time, and you can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. You just get frustrated. So, yeah, I would take him, but I would make sure he did not have one drink. Because everywhere I went, I'm like, come on. You know, and, uh, but, I mean, Sean, he, he used to listen. Um, Gary used to say some things, too, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that Mr. Payton guy. <laughs> I have talked to that guy again, because me and him had a long talk before. But Gary, 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 and I, I knew the future would be bright. I thought that we were, well, I, I don't know, I can't say for them, but for me, I remember I thought I was traded to Cleveland with Lenny Wilkins, and, and Bob Whitsett told me it wasn't true, but I seen a video with, with uh, uh, Hot Rod Williams in town. Mm -hmm. And then I go meet with Bob Whitsett, and he tell me it ain't true, and I just looked at him in his face and say, that's not true. And he said, well, you're not going to be traded. Uh, and I was gone. So you don't always believe what management say. Mm -hmm. And so now people get mad at athletes when they leave. But what about the times when the teams, you know, because you know, I felt like even when I was watching the Sonics in 96, I was still sitting there like, damn, I could help them. I know I could help them. I, re I read an article. It was from summer 95. And they were talking about bringing you back then. I never wanted to get into that, but then, yeah, I sit in me and um, Coach Carr talk at the pro club, and he told me he was gonna bring me back, and it never did, it never materialized. I don't know why, it never materialized that year, and uh, I wound up going to New Jersey, playing my last two years there. <laughs> so let's talk about the infamous fight. The air has obviously been clear between the two of you. Well, it's being clear. Yeah. That's the thing people don't understand. I mean, brothers fight all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, my brother was here at now and kicked his ass many times. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just something that happened. And 
unfortunately it did happen. We moved past that. I remember remember we were in Denver. Mm -hmm. I was still kind of mad. And they said, oh, shit, X, let that shit go. And we shot pool and drunk beer at, at, at um, the Sonics. I was with Phoenix. And so this is, this is post-fight? Yeah, this is after. It was just like mm -hmm. a month, less than a month, maybe about a month after everything happened. Uh, I think a lot of people in the media made more of it than what it was, you know. Um, you fight with your brother all the time, you know. You fight with your sister. Your uncle. Well, I probably wouldn't fight with none of them. They'd probably kill me. But yeah, one of the beautiful things about playing NBA basketball is, is you have a short window to, to get past things. Yeah. You got work to do. So we're professionals. You got to come with it every single night. So you can't linger on anything. And you know, like I said, I remember the time when the night I got traded. I mean, it was like the fans here were like real crazy. But people don't realize I was supposed to be traded long before that. There was a situation where. David Falk called me and told me I was going to the New York Knicks. That was during the time, if some older people in here, we were playing the Bulls in Tampa, played them in the Kingdom, played them in Vancouver. I wasn't even supposed to play in the game in Vancouver because I got a call on my cell phone that I'm possibly going to New York and I won't play. It didn't materialize. So even regardless of what me and Dale got into, I was going to get traded anyhow, you know, and so, uh, and I kind of seen the writing on the wall because when Tom left, um, Derek McKee moved in his spot. Once they found out Derek couldn't play the power forward every night, who was the next man? That was me. Now, this was where Sean Kemp was coming in, where I felt like they probably should have brought Com I mean, um, Sean Kemp in the starting lineup and move Derry back to the bench, you know, because no one's going to outplay me. Mm -hmm. I already know that. The only way you're going to out, outplay me is put me on the bench. So um, I, I kind of seen the writing on the wall. At, at, I, I knew going into that, that year with Hot Rod Williams, I knew that that was a possibility of me getting traded. It, it feels like there were a lot of different things kind of bubbling up yeah. at, at the time of the fight. You're going to hate me for asking you this. What the hell were you thinking getting in a fight with this guy? <laughs> I played I played power four, a little center in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody ever beat you in a fight? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Who beat you in a fight? I got in a lot of fights. We don't want to talk about all the fights <laughs> post NBA time and post college time, because I wasn't always a nice student. I used to get in fights in high school, and some of my friends would get in fights, and. The high school, our high school coach used to be like, pull me, and the word done got around. So they'll pull me out of class because it's somebody in my neighborhood is going to fight. And so they would, they, like I said, pull me out of class, and I would go to the coach's office, and he would take me home so I wouldn't get in a fight. Uh, high school, probably about five or six fights I got into, <laughs> maybe. I was not always a good student. You know, I like to eat food. I take the girls' food, take the boys' food. You know, it was a bunch of dumb kid shit back then. So, um, but you know, those days we summer league fight. We just, I mean, that's just the way it was sometimes. You know, uh, you grow up. I grew up in a tough neighborhood, and um, you know, uh, sometimes we would do some things we shouldn't have to do. It's not like the first time the police came to the house. That's all I can say. <laughs> and so within a few weeks after the actual fight, you guys had made up more or less? Well, I got traded. Yes. Dale you got, got suspended. traded. Yeah, Dale yeah. was suspended. Right. Um, so you, you never played on a court together after that. Yeah. That was it. You guys never yeah. played a game together. Never played a game. No, we were done. And so, but, um, we were, like I said, we were in um, Denver. And I was, like I said, I was still pissed. And they, I remember Nate, well, oh, man, let that shit go, man. You, 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 you just, motherfucker, we ain't on the court now. Mm -hmm. So uh, Derek, Ola, everybody just laughed. Everybody tripping. We shot pool and drunk beer the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. Dale, when you got traded, you end up 
in Milwaukee, traded for, for Ricky Pierce. Um, it kind of felt like the team abandoned you on some level. I'm going back and, and reading some of the the articles about it, like, you know, Dale's on his own. He could do whatever he wants, and that was it. Uh, you know, today with all the mental health resources, it seems like that wouldn't have been a situation that you would be put in today. What did it feel like on your end when you got that call, hey, you're going to Milwaukee? You know, the whole ordeal was kind of difficult, you know, it was, uh, but it motivated me at the same time, you know. I knew what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to play NBA basketball, so I wasn't going to let anything stop me. So when it was when it was tough times, I used that as energy to push me forward, you know, because I always wanted to prove someone different. I can do this. So it wasn't fair at times, you know. I wasn't playing my last year here in Seattle. I had the um, foot was numb. Mm -hmm. I was seeing uh, getting acupuncture done. They realized it was my back. I went, they traded to Milwaukee, and my back went out 10 games before the season was out. And I believe some of my teammates felt like I wasn't playing because I was more interested in getting another paycheck, which, which I was. <laughs> you know, this is a short window. You're not going to play basketball yeah. all your life, so you want to maximize your opportunities. But I, um, I went, had the surgery done, came back and played another 10 years, nine years. But yeah, it was, it was difficult, but it was a, it was a challenge, and I, I love I love the challenge. X, you didn't get the second act with the Sonics, but Dale, you came back in 97-98. Can make the argument that was the last great Sonics team. Won 61 games that year. That was uh, the first Vin Baker year. It was George's last year as coach. What are your memories of, of being on that team in a completely different role than your first stint with the Sonics. I was a free agent. Lenny, Lenny called me. He was coaching in Atlanta. And I'm from yeah. north, just north of Atlanta. Asked me to come there. And I said, OK, I'm coming. I got a call from Georgia the very next day. I, and I had to make a decision. Uh, the Sonics had went to the finals and lost to Chicago the year before. My thought was that um, they got they have an extra chance of getting back there again. I love to be a part of that team. I was like X looking at on the outside looking in thinking, what can I help this team? I like where they're going, what can I help this team, you know? So I, I looked at it that, that way and my daughter was getting ready to go off to college. Mm -hmm. She was a tennis player. So I wanted to work with her her last year with the mental approach to the game. I decided to come back to Seattle. But I didn't know that Sean wasn't gonna be a part of the team. That's <laughs> Sean didn't come back that following season, so I was a little disappointed. Ben was nice to play with, but I was looking forward to playing with Sean and Gary. So you, you didn't spend a lot of time with Gary his rookie year. Uh, both of you, to have him as a rookie, this mouthy guy that doesn't shut up, <laughs> could you have envisioned in your wildest dreams that this guy would be named one of the 75 best players in NBA history? Well, he definitely played with a lot of confidence, you know. He did talk a lot, which... Uh, which was fun to know that you, your teammate is not going to back down on, right. on the court. He's got your back. That was, that was good. Um, um, Xavier's personality is, is pretty much the same, but he doesn't watch that like Gary did. But they play, they play hard. You know what you're going to get every single night. That's important mm -hmm. in winning basketball games. So, yeah, Gary uh, couldn't shoot the ball that well when he came into the league. He developed into a nice three-point shooter. He did a nice job distributing the basketball. When I did come back to Seattle, I had the coaches throwing me passes. Mm -hmm. I said, throw it up here, throw it down here, uh, throw it above my head, because I know Gary will just sling the ball. So. And Nate was good at what, just putting the ball into your rhythm. So I tried to get prepared for that, because I know Gary might not hit me right where I want the ball. But it was fun to play with. I think it's this passion that I seen early on, mm -hmm. you know, when we were playing. Uh, talk a lot of trash, which was fine. But I think you look at him in practice and you look at him in the game, you can see why he was number two pick. And uh, incredible hands, mm -hmm. incredible hand-eye coordination, know how to play the passing lanes. And um, I'm not surprised he was on that 75th all to, um 75th anniversary team. Um, I mean, he deserves it. I think Gary's done a great, great job. Mm -hmm. um, 
coming in as the number two pick. You got two. You got me and Dale Ellis. You got Sean Kemp, and he still found a way to make his mark. And it wasn't even given to him. Now he earned it. I mean, he busts his ass every day in training camp. So I tell people, you know, some people get that position, you know, and I'm one. You know, I remember the time I came off the bench. Everybody used to say I didn't like coming off the bench. And I, not one day that I ever said it. There's not one quote that I said I would never come off the bench. But as you get older, you learn that management, Michael Fee, the media, certain things, never said it. So when I was coming off the bench, I, I, like I tell people all the time, I ain't had no problem with it. It's just the fact that, you know, as long as we winning, that's all I cared about. And that's what I seen in Gary. Gary has, that motherfucker loves to win. And, and he, you know, when you get guys that like to get on the floor, you got something special, you know. He's going to dive on that floor and he's going to do this. And he, you know, he's going to, he going to, it was just something about Gary. And I knew I seen it. And, I, and, and like I said, he actually took the spot from Nate. He didn't, wasn't given that spot. Nate had that spot. And he kind of, he won that spot from Nate. And Nate went to the bench that year. But I, I, I enjoy those 15, 16 games with Gary. When you guys were outside of uh, your time in Seattle, call it you know, 92, 93 range, when Gary and Sean really started to take off, there's definitely a sliding door scenario where Sonic starting five is the two of you, Sean, Gary, Tom Chambers. You're, you're watching this team, 93, their Western Conference Finals, and they were one of the best teams for about three or four years. To watch that from afar and, and know that maybe you, you would have been the, the difference maker, that could have been your team, what, what did that feel like? Uh, to me, I mean, I always root. When they were in the, the finals, I was with Phoenix, or I was with New York, I was with Boston. I, I, I would root for those guys. I would uh, be talking with Nate or Gary, you know, before the games and stuff. So I was rooting for them. I was like, I wish Magic Johnson ass would have been gone when, before 92, <laughs> you know, maybe we could have went some games. Yeah. But I mean, that was the changing of Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, a lot of older guys. And, and that was the, the new era of the glove, the rain man uh, out west. And, and, you know, you got some other young talent coming in a couple of years later, but um, that was tough, man. You know, watching Matumbo block shots and, and Robert Pack. And, you know, one thing I know in the NBA, you can run that George Carr style offense because the NBA is game, day off, game, game, game. And, you don't have time to prepare for that. But when you got time to prepare for that, all that trapping, you you understand how to attack it. You don't give it the ball to the big guy. I know when we was here with Boston one time, and the first thing I said, I, I was Chris Ford was going, I said, hold on, Chris. Can I say one thing? That's it. Let's F all this on the board. Sherman Douglas, you're gonna have a hell of a night, but you're gonna be you're gonna get in shape this night. You got to get it. I want you to attack Sam Perkins. Or you attack um, Deadless Shrimp. They are the slow moving feet people. So if you turn back, then that's where Gary comes in here. So you just keep going around. And when you, once you break it, you kick it up. And I was telling the other guys, did you get it? You fucking dunk the ball, but don't lay the damn ball up because Sean's coming. So you got to go in with your knees up, ready to dunk the ball. And, and that's how we beat the Sonics. With the teams that I was with, we had a couple of days to prepare. I was showing them how to beat them because you got Sam up there, you try to throw it, he's 6'9", with 7 foot 4 yeah. arms, mm -hmm. you know. You get the ball, you go straight at Sam. He's not going to stop you. If you stop, then Gary's coming, and now they got the trap. That's how they used to get people. So every team that I played for, or even Phoenix, Kevin Johnson, once you go by, once you kick it up, Tom, Dan Marley, everybody got to dunk the damn ball because I know Sean's coming, you know? And that's how you 
prepare for the Sonics because if you didn't prepare and you you got a game and you got to come to Seattle, ah, oh, you're probably gonna lose by 20. <laughs> that, that that was the way it was. We played the same way. They just did it a little bit better than we did because what we we would always play the trapping. Mm -hmm. We come out and mm -hmm. we trap people, and if we get you going, boom, boy, we got these steals, we get these steals, and we mount a point. George Carr brought it in, and he did it a little bit better because I felt like they had better athletes. You know, Tom wasn't a real good trapper. So when you ain't got a real good trapper in there, it only takes one man to break down. So George Carr brought it, and he brought it to a new level. You were all over Elijah Wan, trapping Elijah Wan yeah. in that game six in 87. Man, how did he get some of them shots off? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> pretty, pretty incredible, the, the numbers that he was able to put yeah. up. Dale, you are undoubtedly one of the best shooters in NBA history. I'm a, a huge shooting geek myself. Let's talk about hand position, where you're looking, when you're shooting. Like, what, what, were, what was your routine as far as shooting goes? Like, what, what were some of the things that you did that allowed you to be? Well, as a kid on the playgrounds, you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar was my favorite player. So I started throwing hook shots before I learned how to put my left hand on the ball and shoot it. When you're throwing a hook shot, you, you're looking at rotation, how the ball rotates. And then, you know, I got a little older, so I put my left hand and shooting it and still trying to rotate it. But I love the game basketball. I grew up playing something like football, baseball, basketball. I love basketball. Uh, we'd play. If something was bothering me in school or at home, I'd play until I couldn't play anymore. If the guys didn't want to play anymore, I'd stay on the, on, the, on the court and shoot until I was exhausted. So in shooting it, what you didn't want to do is go chasing the ball. So you had to really <laughs> work on the rotation. So you make it go in the hoop. And they could spin right back to the area you're standing in so you can get shots up. So and late in my career, I would go to practice early and shoot until I make 100 threes. George was the only coach who said to me, uh, hey, can you uh, stay out to practice and do that? <laughs> Set an example to some of the players. And, you know, plus you're expending a lot of energy. I want you to practice hard. So, George, I can do this before practice and after practice. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy doing it, but... Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, I played with some good guards, too, Avery Johnson mm -hmm. and, and uh, Nate McMillan. Um, the key for my success was just being able to center screens, you know. I wanted to catch it and shoot it first and foremost. If I saw an opening to the basket, I'd take it. But I wasn't trying to put the ball on the floor no more than one or two dribbles if I had to. Mm -hmm. And then um, playing with Nate and, both, and, and um, Avery, and also Gary, um, I was able to lose guys in transition where you could walk into a three-point shot. I used to drive the opponents, coaches, crazy. But And then, you know, I had guys like Xavier, you know. Xavier sets one hard pick. Now it's easy for me to get open because they're worried about getting hit again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was fun playing the game. We had to play. We used to come up court and we used to do like this. This means back pick. No matter where to play, back pick. And we had Tom on one post and me and out on another. I would come up and say the back pick for Dale. And the defender can't see me. So when Dale take off, I'm like, take off hard. And I get this like this right here. And they just back right into it. And guys would be like, ah! <laughs> and now Dale got a choice to come on either side and shoot it. I think we used to call it, uh, what we call it? Wow. Pow, uh, pow, yeah. pow. If he mm -hmm. said, if Nate come down and say pow, and this, this always mean back pick. You can say Hulk, this means back pick. It's going to be some type of Hulk pick, Hulk set with a back pick, but it was pow. Mm -hmm. And and I would always set the back pick on the guard, and the guard can't see me coming up. And Dale's job is to run him on hard. Mm -hmm. And then I just try to crack his back. <laughs> so... <laughs> Dale, yeah. I, I think uh, your career high in three point attempts is like 4.7. If you were playing today, you got to figure you're putting up somewhere between 8 and 12 a game. Your highest points per game was 27.5. If you're playing today, how many points a game do you think you score? Points a game? Yeah. Per game? What do you think your points per game average would be playing today at your peak? Do you no. hit 40? Nah. No? no. You'd be putting up twice as many threes. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
Uh, I'm just doing the math. I'm like, that's pretty close yeah. to 40. It's like a pickup game now. You know, there's, there's no such thing as a bad shot in the NBA anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just taking it. I, I miss the old school basketball. I always believe the highest percentage shot is the light of it. Right. It's got to be simple. I, I, and I still believe that too. But mm -hmm. let's just say if Dale had 500 layups in his games and dunks off the break, that's 1,500 more points probably mm -hmm. for him, you know. Uh, for me, if I'm on the break, go dunk it. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think I'll make one out of nine, one out of ten. So for me, it would be something different. But for Dale, in today's game, you see Steph Curry, he on a fast mm -hmm. break. He stops and put a three-pointer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the game is totally different. I mean, yeah. he, would, he, would, he would have easily, easily another – Thousand, thousand uh, three pointers easily right now today. Mm -hmm. yeah, it'd have been easy to get the shots off today because yeah. you, you got so many guys shooting them. And they're not paying attention to me. So yeah. get, get some wide open looks easy. And yeah. I think when you look at Dale Curry and you see how much running he does to get that shot, Dale would sit in the middle and come off a single double and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's also a lot bigger because I used to be like, damn man, how the fuck you get this shot off? I mean, I got a double pump, and he be, I mean, you can see, you watch that game against Houston, how many shots he got off. Just, I mean, Robert Reed was on a lot of shots. And me, I probably would have been double pumping or something to try to get the shot off. And he would just lean and just let it go. I, I think he would probably 14, 15 shots a game just at the three, you know. How, how were you able to get those shots off so quickly coming off those screens? What, what did you have to do to work up to get, like, I mean, it was just like automatic. Yeah. Run off that screen and that ball's up, that's it. Basketball is done with spacing. If you can create the space, you can play, you know, uh, in the post situation on, on the perimeter. And it's a lot easier to play the game now because you can't hand check. Mm -hmm. If a guy's facing you, you, automatic ha you automatically have the, the spacing that you need to get shots off. But um, just being able to, just footwork, um, you repetition you, know, you, you take so many of those shots you all you're already into the shot before you see the basket you already turn to give up the shot as you about seeing the basket just getting it off quick as possible some people say look at the back of the rim look in the hoop yeah uh i'm, I'm such a huge dork that i uh i watched the steph curry master class on shooting he mm -hmm. said he looks at the hooks where were you looking yeah, well, I got into a, a slump. When I get in a slump, what I normally do is drill the ball, shoot it flat, try to make it go straight in. I used to practice making hit the back of the rim and come back to you. But uh, when I'm not shooting the ball well, it gets seems to get flat and flatter, and I have to go to the gym and work on shooting with arc. And so George said, um, "Hey man, just aim for the back of the rim." I look at George. <laughs> I don't know what I aim for. I just shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. George, you don't know anything about shooting a basketball. Yeah. I look at the entire rim, back yeah. going off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just try to hit the middle of that rim. I look at all of it. I don't aim for anything but the bottom of the net. Well, it worked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, it, it worked. X, let's, uh, let's not say that you were the best fighter, but you were definitely an intimidator. W what were some of your intimidation tactics uh, against your opponent? Because there's, there's such a mental game to it, too. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I really didn't have anything. <laughs> when I come, I, I tell people all the time, when it, my, this is my pregame, I used to go to, oh man, right up the street. Uh, I don't even think it's there no more. I used to go to this restaurant, I used to get, um, who? Yes. No, it's right on the hill coming down, and right before you come up with the elephant, it used to be off where the Seattle, um, oh, 13 coins? 13 coins. I used to go to 13 coins and I get the, I used to get the trout and I get the uh, noodles with it. And that's all I would have. And I come to the game, once I pull in that parking lot, I am not Xavier McDaniel no more. I am straight to X, man. I'm just focused. I may joke a little bit, but my mind is really on the game and I'm just thinking about what I got to do. And, um, when I go out and play, depends on who I'm playing against. I know if I'm playing Dennis Rodman, 
I know some issues gonna happen, you know. Um, but if I'm playing Rodney McCray or Alex English or Mark Aguirre or any other good small forward, Mike Mitchell, late Mike Mitchell, I, I'm not worrying about going into a game and thinking that I'm gonna do this or do that. I just, I'm, I'm worrying about self. Right now, I'm going over my scouting report. You know, I get fussed at because I left it there and, I, and, I, and Kloppenberg would say, I already know who I'm playing against. I know everybody. And sometimes I would leave it in my locker. And I come in, I'm, I'm just ready. I'm the X-Man now. And, and, and my saying, Richard, shower, hot shower. And I just come, I'm, I'm ready to play. And if you hit me with an elbow, I'm gonna hit you back. Simple as that. Now things get a little heated. That's how most things get heated. Now Dennis Rodman is another. He's another clown <laughs> that you got to deal with. That when you go into the game, you already know he's going to do some things to you. So, but you try to make sure you try to maintain your cool. Sometimes, you know, officials let him get away with certain things, and sometimes you got to straighten the guy out. Mm -hmm. But I never really go. I, honestly, I really never go into a game thinking about fighting. You know. Uh, I just go in and just play hard. It's definitely a, a different style of game. I, when I was watching game six, my wife sat down next to me, and I think it was the start of the second OT, yeah. and you just push a game in the back. It, it, no technicals, like he, he kind of came after yeah. you a little bit. Well, I think that was like, I think Maurice had some issues with it too. The NBA got a rule that you, the, when you were doing the jump ball, mm -hmm. and I was already there, and he pushed me out the way. <laughs> And I pushed him back because this is my spot. I got the spot first on jump ball. So um, if you're in the down by their basket, then you know the the, the offense get the inside. Then mm -hmm. two defensive guys got a pinch on them. So uh, if I got a spot first, that's my spot. He can't get that spot. And uh, Akeem actually pushed me, and I pushed him back. But. Uh, uh, Things are happening in the course of the game. And Keem, Keem can get messy, too. It, that, was, you know? that was before he, he, he was a little tamer as he got older, but he, he was kind yeah. of kind of uh, a hot wire at, at yeah. that point in his career. Your style on the court, I'd say it's very recognizable. I don't think there was anybody that, that had a shaved head before you. No. Now yeah. look, 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 the big brother see? got one like me now. But you did, I mean, a lot of people. <laughs> see, see, see. <laughs> hey, hey. I, I, but you had hair, a lot yeah. of people. I, I could Michael still Jordan go. shaved his head yeah, because he was losing hair. his hair. Yeah. How, how come you went with the, the bald head? I'm a, uh, in, in 1982, yeah, 82 season, 82, 83 season, my sophomore year, me, Arby Sherrod, James Gibbs, were going to the barbershop. And we were getting our hair, and everybody was talking about, man, let's get a bald head. And I was first up. <laughs> I got a bald head. And they were like, nah, we ain't doing it. <laughs> I get to the game, everybody's going crazy. I mean, when I say they're going crazy, and then it just stuck. <laughs> it stuck. I mean, the fans, when I tell you they was going crazy, I mean, these fans in Wichita was going crazy. And I got a couple of dunks, and next thing you know, they had posters with my ball head up, and it just stayed. I never, I never let it grow too much more out since then. So, and then when I came here, I did a poster with Slick Watts, who was ball headed in the NBA. I guess Slick and I was, was in a barbershop the originator. in a chair, you know. So, and then one day I was reading the Jet magazine, Michael Jordan started the ball head in the NBA. I like. Oh, I didn't know. I started to sit him a little bit, but I didn't, I didn't sweat it. But now I see a lot of guys that Clyde Drexler, he ball-headed, and I mean a lot of people. Uh, so I, I guess it's a, a trend that, that I started that Michael Jordan got credit for. Mm -hmm. so. Bald head and double wristbands. Yep. We're, 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 the wristbands the because that? my wrist used to swell up. When I was in college, I'd be dunking, and I'd be trying to pull the rim down. <laughs> And my wrist would start swelling up, so I started putting a wristband on. And it kept swelling up, so I started doing double. And, and that kind of, it just kind of carried over. Mm -hmm. And I did it from college all the way through, because high school, my high school, we couldn't wear knee sleeves, we couldn't wear wristbands, we couldn't wear headbands. 
socks had to be up high. I mean, I had one of them coaches like uh, Coach Carter. <laughs> very, very strict, very strict. Trust me, I've been sitting on the bench a lot because of discipline. A sophomore year, I didn't even start as a sophomore. Started as a, so a freshman. No, a sophomore started. I didn't start as a junior because I had a lot of discipline problems. And so I wound up sitting on the bench my whole junior year if I want to be on the team. So. That's, I mean, that's the story of the X-Men. Yeah. That, crazy days back then. Yep, definitely. That, uh, that is the definition of, of the X-Men, the birth yeah. of the X-Men, yeah. as they say. Uh, if we're looking back at Sonic's history, wh where do you guys feel it, that you fit in, in that whole realm? Well, I think our body work speaks for itself. Now, people would have to say where we, we are. I just know during that time, for five years and two months, you know, um, I think I did what I was supposed to do here. Mm -hmm. I helped the team get relevant again and uh, helped the team to the Western Conference Finals. And I tell people all the way, and, and all along, we made some decent money, made good money. So that would be up to fans and that would be up to media to where we are in the place of the Sonics, in the history of the Sonics. Um, you know, I, I just know what I've done uh, for the Sonics. I, I feel good that I gave it my best 110% every night. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Sonics have a rich his history. Uh, they won a championship in 79. I was coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. I remember Dennis Johnson and Gus Williams and Jack Sigma. I got a chance to compete against those guys. They were still in the league. And uh, actually I actually had the opportunity to play with Jack when I got traded to Milwaukee. That was fun. I remember that step back him, yeah. he had, throw the ball behind <laughs> you, can't block it. Jack was fun to play with. And, um, yeah, so I agree with X. It's, it's in the hands of the fans. It's decide where we fit into the whole scheme of things. You probably get asked about the Wes Matthews incident all the time. Right. Uh, but you were playing that game. Mm -hmm. the, there's, the video footage is very grainy and it's quick and you can't really see it. So everybody's uh, memory of this is the picture of you strangling him and his eyes are coming out of his head. <laughs> what were you thinking when you're on the court and you're seeing this? So uh, typical ex. You know, I'm really excited <laughs> about the game. <laughs> like I was telling the ex today, I, I have that picture in my phone. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Played with a lot of intensity. He played hard right. every single night, you know. So it's nice to be on the court with, a, with players you know is going to give you the 110% every single night and do whatever it takes to win. And we're not trying to hurt anybody, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but we play physical basketball. I miss that physical basketball watching mm -hmm. that, you know, the banging inside with the big men. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was fun to watch. Yeah. You, you have to be skillful down there. So you can hurt yourself easily, mm -hmm. you know. Get, you get... Uh, you go into a basket full speed and uh, you have an awkward center there. And, you know, we're playing physical. Uh, it could hurt you by mistake. But, um, you know, guys like Curry come down the lane and shoot, make a layup. Um, okay, fine. It comes down again and makes a layup. Okay, timeout. Timeout. Uh, if he comes down there again, if he's not on his back, you, you, and you, you're not playing. Yeah. He's not saying don't. He's not saying hurt him. He's saying make him think twice about coming yeah, down. Give him a hard whack. Yeah, that's how yeah. we play, though. Mm -hmm. Then older Paul and this was good for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> OP was good for that, too. But um, Maurice Lucas, man, I tell you, that's why I wish we had kept him a couple more years. Kept guys straight. But, you know, I tell people all the time, you, you really can't see it. But when I was talking to Ron Thorne, I never got fined for that. But you, you can't see it. But you're Did you get a tee for that? Huh? Did you get teed up for that? Yeah, I got okay. a tee. But if you, <laughs> Did if you get you, tossed? But if you really watch it, you re no, I didn't even get tossed. <laughs> but if you really watch it, you'll see he really actually tried to kick me in the face. Mm -hmm. you got to really, you got to try to slow it up. And a lot of people don't realize that he tried to kick me. So Ron, when we were looking, he was like, yeah, I did see it. So I'm going to let the fine go. And, um, but they didn't take the tee back. And he told me, me and Ron always had an agreement, no more fights. 
no more fights. And that's all, that's all. Hey, I'll try, but mm. I can't help it if a guy comes at me now. And so, uh, but if you really look, you'll see his feet coming up and you'll see my head coming back and then I'm going forward. It happened so quick, you know? And, uh, but I, like I said, I, I was saying earlier, um, when we were just around talking, I tried to apologize to the guy. Seen him in Atlanta at a club, and me and my friend Cheese Johnson, Wichita State alumni brother, played with Golden State a few years. And we, I was like, man, that's where so I'm gonna go over there and apologize. And I was trying to talk to him. He walked off, went and got security, and security <laughs> told me just leave him alone. I said, man, you can tell I just tried to apologize, but I guess if he gonna act like a little bean, then f it then. <laughs> You know, you're so being a nice guy. I was, you're being I was the bigger man. Trying to be the bigger man. Honest, I really was trying to be the bigger man. To he was just like, ah, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me. But <laughs> so we're gonna try something real quick as as we wrap up here. We're calling it caption contest. So we've got a handful of classic basketball cards from guys that you played with when you were with the Sonics. Um, so we're gonna show you. Uh, show you these cards, and you guys can come up with a caption. Oh. We're going to start out with a, a 1990 Skybox, Nate McMillan, dunking. Mm. Oh, I threw that to him. Really? Yes. I don't know, but I probably did throw it. Because we had a set. We had a set called One Up. Yeah. You remember that, Dale? Mm -hmm. Nate would throw it to me, and he will come off Alton, and I would throw it up to him. I don't know if that's it or not, but <laughs> it sounds good though. Yeah. But we did have a play called One Up, and Nate, I would throw him the alley you exactly. off of One Up back then. What What's the caption you're giving for this card? One Up. One Up. One Up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. We've got your guy, Alton Lister. Oh, big garbage. Big garbage? <laughs> big garbage. Big garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that come gave, from? Uh, huh? I believe Xavier gave him that name. I don't know hey, sure came I'm from. not sure who, how, how it came up, but you know, out and a little goofy, and we just, we just somehow we just start calling Big Garbage. Mm -hmm. Give him the ball, Big Garbage. Yeah. Great. There we go. Look at this good-looking guy. 1990 hoops, Dale Ellis All Star card. A little sleepy, right? Well, there. before he was an assassin, we used to call him 3D before he got the assassin name. You won, mm -hmm. you won the three-point contest that year, and yeah. just casually, I think, would you put up 27 in the All-Star game? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is sleepy? Sleepy. Yeah, I look tired <laughs> right there. <laughs> Were you tired? No. Mm -mm. When you're playing games like that, you don't get tired. You know, you, you want that game to go on and on. We played in a, a five-time over, overtime game in Milwaukee. Yeah. That got a, the worst thing about that was that we had to play Chicago. <laughs> we had to go play Chicago, I had to chase Michael, but that was a fun game to play. Mm -hmm. So we've got, X. this is your 86 Fleer rookie card. Mm -hmm. What's our caption? No close mouth or something. I don't know, got my mouth all wide open. Like this. <laughs> I want that ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're playing the Clippers, so. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, those are some pretty bad teams. You're probably getting the ball in that yeah. in that uh, situation. Oh. So Dale three eighty nine <laughs> hoops. This was your point guard right before T. here. Ernest T. Bass. That's what we used to call him. That's Ernest T. Bass right there. T. Bass. Ernest T. Bass off Andy Griffin. <laughs> you remember he had the little hat. Yeah. I started calling him Ernest T. Bass. <laughs> Here's a good one. Uh, Eighty five star Frank Rakowski. You got to play with Brick, uh, yeah. not as a Sonic, but as a black, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you had a, a short stint yeah, with, X, one year with, or, uh, with with Brick, mm -hmm. um, your first year in Seattle. Yeah, well, he, he represented physical physicality, I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to mind, figure out what he's screaming contact. at yeah. or what he's yelling at right now. When I look at this, to me, he looks like Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's like an overgrown version of Cameron. That's a good-looking card right there. 91 Flair, Michael Cage. Cookie Head Jenkins. <laughs> That's what I used to call it because he had the curls. Yes. And you remember the movie? Oh, my curls. My curls. <laughs> Cookie Head Jenkins. <laughs> Could you touch the curls? Huh? Could you touch the curls? Would I you never touch touched Mike curls. Never touched them. Who had a better perm? Michael Cage or Jack Sigma? 
Michael Cage. <laughs> Michael Cage? <laughs> Michael Jack, Cage. Jack had a pretty good perk. Jack had a little slick. <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't <laughs> Definitely Michael Cage. <laughs> That is our caption contest, and we're going to wrap things up here. Where, where can we find you guys? Social media, how do we keep in touch with you? It's, it's unbelievable to have you guys here, but how do we, how do we keep the conversation going? Where, where can people find you? I'm on Instagram. I'm, I'm doing a little Facebook also, but I follow, um, I follow you guys. Mm -hmm. And I'm on no social media site. I don't do FaceTime. I don't do nothing. Who owns xman.com? You should own xman.com. That should be a thing. Yeah, mm. probably should, but <laughs> uh, you want to call me, 803-600-5980. Hell, everybody in America got that number. <laughs> Had it for 25 years. You call anybody in Columbia, they know the number. So, I mean, if you want to get me, call me on my cell phone. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always out. So I don't do the social media. I just never got into it. Just never got into it. And, and Jamie's got to get us. Where's Jamie? The lights are too bright here. But J Jamie's got to find a way where we can get Dale jerseys and X jerseys. Well, I've given, I've given him one year <laughs> to get the jerseys of me and Dale and, and have it so people can get it. <laughs> or we may see another Wes Matthews coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what's up, Jamie. So, Jamie, <laughs> you're on the clock. There he is. Well, I know huge. he's over there. I know I see him over there. Yeah. Huge thanks to you both for, for making the time, for being here with everybody. It, it is great to see you, and it is an absolute honor to have you guys as, as the first two guests of Sonics Forever Live. So thank until you. next time. Thank, thank you. you. Good job, man.